What is going on, NFL fans, and welcome back to another episode of the NFL Whip Around. I am one of the hosts, Jeff Hartman, joined by Coach Kevin Smith. Coach, what's up? What's up, Jeff? Great week to talk about NFL football, man. Some exciting stuff on tap. And a slate of games that a lot of us, myself included, thought was was not going to be that great. Actually turned out to be very competitive games. And we'll talk about some of those games that went down to the wire, whether you're talking Dallas and Washington, Carolina and Kansas City, Houston and Tennessee. We'll be talking about all those teams here in a second. But I think it's important that we start with, in my opinion, the biggest story in the NFL after I, you know, when we're recording this, Monday Night Football hasn't happened yet, but we're talking about Saquon Barkley. Coach, Saquon Barkley, my gosh, what a performance that he had in L.A. against the Rams. Uh, I mean, you, you can read off his stat line in a second, but his Eagles improved to 9-2 and two with that win. He leads the NFL in yards from scrimmage, has arguably been the best offensive player in the league. No running back has won the MVP since 2012. I think that was Adrian Peterson. Should Barkley break that streak? But I'll let you talk about his performance first before we jump the gun. Yeah, man. I mean, phenomenal performance. I watched that whole game. That was that was exciting. Even, even as a game that wasn't ultimately that competitive, the Rams hung around, but you never got the sense that they were going to win that game. It was exciting simply because – you didn't know what was coming next. I mean, Saquon Barkley has produced some pretty awesome highlights so far this season. Uh, he was running guys over right and left. At one point, he ran over a cameraman and a, and a guy holding the sound boom. And uh, he finished with 255 rushing yards. That's the ninth most in a single game in NFL history. 302 yards from scrimmage. That's 10th most. So two top 10 all-time performances. And he didn't. he didn't look... It didn't look hard. That was the thing that was crazy. I mean, the, the Eagles, to their credit, were blowing guys off the ball. And the Rams, to their discredit, were doing a terrible job uh, in, uh, in their run defense. Their run fits were awful, meaning, like, they just didn't have guys filling gaps. To be able to get 270-plus yard touchdown runs and not be touched in either one. He wasn't touched in either one. Uh, that's hard to do in the NFL these days. So credit to Philly, L.A. got some work to do in their run defense. But to answer the question you led with, 100%, yes. I, I, I'm 100% in on Saquon Barkley as the MVP. And I think there's a lot of reasons why, but I, you know, I kind of let you weigh in on the subject as well here. I, first and foremost, I don't remember during his time in New York or even precursor to Penn State, I don't remember him having that burst that we're seeing in Philadelphia. His ability to... Like the, the first play from in the third quarter, in the second half. And Sean McVay tells the sideline reporter, we need to go out there and make a stop. That was great. First was play, great. gone, 70 yard touchdown. And he was just, it been better. Like said, no, could have been better. There was no, I, the segue from the McVay interview to the touchdown run was maybe two <laughs> seconds. <laughs> they should have, they should have done a shot of Sean McVay right after that run. That would have been a great, uh, very <laughs> apropos. But I guess for me, I asked myself about the MVP question. Christian McCaffrey has done some fantastic things in this league and he's never won it. So is what Saquon Barkley doing that special that the voters would say, ah, we're not going to give it to a quarterback. We're actually going to give it to a running back. And as much as dominant as he's being, I can't say that the answer for me is yes. Christian McCaffrey was like a human joystick for like two or three seasons with San Francisco racking up all purpose yards, rushing, receiving doesn't matter. And he never was even in consideration, serious consideration for it. I don't know. What's your take on that? I think the problem for Christian McCaffrey was that he was competing against peak Patrick Mahomes and that there was always a quarterback in there having an absolutely lights out year. And it's a quarterback centric league. And the teams for whom those quarterbacks were having those great years were clearly among the best in the league. Well, this year, outside of perhaps Josh Allen, there isn't a quarterback for a contender having an absolute lights-out year. I mean, Jared Goff's having a good year for, for Detroit, but you can't say Jared Goff is carrying the Lions. Lamar Jackson's having a really good year, but the Ravens are 7-4. and four. I, Again, Allen would probably be the biggest competitor, I, I think, right now to Barkley. But if you look at impact, and the impact that Saquon Barkley is making on games. And the difference between Philadelphia's offense last year and this year, he's he's the missing piece for them. And, and he's the guy 
for whom you absolutely must game plan and must stop. So I would, I'd be willing to listen to an, a Josh Allen argument, but other than Josh Allen, I just, I don't know who the guy, who is, who's, who's yeah. the MVP no, if, right. not, if not, if not Barkley. I mean, Patrick Mahomes is always going to garner votes because he's a quarterback in a 10 and one team. And even though they almost lose, who's the one that makes the play to get him in field goal range. It was Patrick Mahomes with his leg uh, legs, obviously against Carolina on Sunday. But I think for me, I agree with you. And I think that Saquon Barkley would have an edge over Josh Allen, unless Josh Allen really starts to put the pedal down. And I'm talking about gaudy quarterback statistics. I think there's a cloud that hovers over Josh Allen. And it's not intentional. It's just the fact that the guy's never been able to get over the hump. He's never been able to slay that dragon when it matters the most. You talked about this on your call sheet podcast about how he just can't beat Patrick Mahomes in the playoffs. Regular season, he's got it. Playoffs, different story. So I think that right now, Saquon Barkley is probably the front runner. And like I always said when I was coaching and had to give this award out to my high school team, I coached lacrosse, by the way, uh, I said this went to the player that value had the most value to our team. And I think Saquon Barkley brings the most value to his team. If you take Saquon Barkley off the Eagles, I don't think they're that dynamic. I don't know. You might disagree, but I watched a lot of their games and it now seems like if they lose Saquon Barkley for any stretch of time, they're going to be struggling on offense. Right. Because the fall off is from Saquon Barkley is to Kenneth Gainwell. And he, exactly. you know, he, he's a serviceable NFL running back, but he is by no means the guy you suddenly have to stop. There's a domino effect in Philadelphia with that offense right now, which is this. You absolutely have to now commit extra guys to the run game. On that second touchdown run, the 70-yarder that came in the fourth quarter, the Rams had 10 guys within five yards of the football. 10 guys. And, you know, Philly, Philly blocked it up nicely and the Rams fit it poorly, but you still couldn't stop it. Yeah. So if teams are now going to have to commit those extra guys to the box, you're now you're going to free up A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith when he gets healthy in single coverage somewhere. And Philadelphia has the opportunity now to beat you in, a, in, in multiple ways. You take Barkley out of the equation, it gets a lot easier now to defend that passing game. So we know that this has always been true of quarterbacks. You take the you take the quarterback out, you put in the backup, the offense falls off a cliff, so to speak. Right. But it hasn't always been true of running backs. In Barkley's instance, it's absolutely true of him. And it's going to be interesting to see how the rest of the season plays out. Uh, Barkley does have some tough games coming up. Uh, they still have to play the Baltimore Ravens. They still have to play the Pittsburgh Steelers. So some good defenses are still on the docket for the Philadelphia Eagles, but I'm sure that the – the go bird land out there has calmed down a little bit from their let's fire uh, Sirianni from just a few weeks ago. I mean, but even even Eagles fans were stoked today. You know, you talk to <laughs> Eagles fans. So look at so think about it like this. Barkley's got just shy of 1,400 yards right now. And the Eagles have six games remaining. So he's he's averaging over 100 yards rushing per game. If he winds up, if he continues at that pace, he's going to be over 2,000 for the season. You rush for over 2,000 yards for a team that's going to win its division and, and may get the number one overall seed in the NFC. In the absence of somebody having an absolute knockout year at the quarterback position, I don't know how he's not the MVP. Yeah, I agree. And so, like I said, unless he gets injured or unless something happens where Josh Allen just goes on an absolute tear, we'll see. But the, the theme of today's podcast is statements were made <laughs> statements have been made and so the statement from the eagles on a national audience that was a statement win the new york giants have made several statements recently both physically or actually literally and figuratively and the biggest news was that they released daniel jones we knew that he was getting benched tommy devito your boy from north jersey and then they released him he asked for his release uh the owner mara puts out a statement and says well grant it as of this being recorded, he has not chosen where he's going to go. What was your take when you heard that Daniel Jones is getting released from the Giants? Well, uh, when I had, when I read the, the day before he was released that that he had played strong safety on the scout team in practice <laughs> at a walkthrough, I was like, oh my god, this is not <laughs> this is not going to end well for Daniel Jones and the Giants. I've never heard of that before, and the fact that they sat him down so that they didn't have to pay him. The, uh, the potential injury money they would owe him if he stayed in the lineup. You could see where this was going. But it still was pretty shocking. I mean, he's been the off-and-on starter 
for six years, more on than off. I didn't realize it was that long. And, uh, and obviously they were just never able to kind of get it going around Daniel Jones. But I think Daniel Jones is the kind of guy that could be like a Jared Goff or, or maybe like a Geno Smith. That might be a better comp because Jared Goff went to a Super Bowl in L.A. But, you know, Geno, Geno Smith kind of scuffled around for a bunch of years and, and never quite found the right fit and was, was definitely considered a bust because he was a first-round pick. Uh, and then winds up out in Seattle and he kind of gets hooked up with Shane Waldron and jumpstarts his career. And I mean, Geno Smith is arguably a, a you know, a, a top 12 quarterback in the NFL right now, man, top 15 for sure. Um, I mean, I think if Daniel Jones, and we don't know where he's going to land, but if he winds up landing in, in a better system with a more stable offensive group uh, and, a, and a coaching staff that can get him right, He's he's a talented guy. He, you know, he he's got the skills to be successful in the league. You have to the thing that's killed him is taking sacks and turning the ball over. And if you can find a team that minimizes those mistakes, then they might be able to reclaim him. Yeah. You bring up like a reclamation project. Gino is a great example. I think Baker Mayfield would be another mm-hmm. example. Yep. I'm struggling to think of more. <laughs> <laughs> Jared Goff got to a Super Bowl. So he was yeah. still a pretty good quarterback before getting dealt to Detroit. There's way more that they never return to that form and they just become career backups. And that's just what they do for the rest of their career. Someone like Carson Wentz comes to mind. Very dominant for Philadelphia, played well. He gets hurt. Daniel Jones got hurt last year with his neck injury, I believe. And then it's just never the same. They get cut and they bounce around the league. I think that it's easy for us to sit here and say, oh, yeah, if he goes to the right system, but the question is, is what is that system? The rumors that are out there as of this being recorded, are like that Baltimore is interested and that new England is interested. Those don't make any sense. And if I'm a free agent, which Daniel Jones is, I'm not going there. Are you kidding me? Now he said he wants to play for a contender this year. I get it. He wants to experience the playoffs. He wants to get a, maybe a, a Super Bowl ring. Who the hell knows? But at the same time, am I going to want to go to new England with Drake may he's a starter for the next, however many years, just like he just like, you know, the Giants had Daniel Jones at the start. I'm going to go behind Lamar Jackson. I mean, he, the dude gets hurt sometimes, but I don't know if I want to sit behind that. Where do you think he's going to go? I mean, when you look at San Francisco's situation, that makes a little bit of sense right now with Brock Purdy being dinged up. You look at the Vikings. I mean, are they how comfortable are they with Nick Mullins as the backup to Sam Darnold? Uh, I mean, Sam Darnold's playing some pretty good football for, for Minnesota this year, but if the Vikings are nine and two. They're right in the thick of everything. If Darnold went down, would they be okay with, with a guy like Nick Mullins being their, their quarterback? Maybe that might be a spot that, you know, that that's an interesting spot too, because we, we talk about reclaiming Daniel Jones. You get him with a coach like Kevin O'Connell, who's been fantastic in developing quarterbacks. And he might be, that might be the right fit. And maybe it won't be the right fit for Daniel Jones long-term considering Darnold's there and they drafted JJ McCarthy and a lot of people think he might be the future, but it might, they might be able to sort of get to Daniel Jones in a way that turns his career around. Even if he winds up elsewhere. I mean, if I were Daniel Jones and the Minnesota Vikings were interested, I would jump at that just for the opportunity to play for Kevin O'Connell. So let's do some predictions. Where do you see him going this year? I expect it's just going to be a one-year deal. He's going to stay. He might even, hell, if he doesn't have a lot of serious offers, he might wind up on a practice squad and then get elevated on game days or whatever the case may be. What do you think? Uh, where do you predict him to go? Well, I'll tell you what. If I were the San Francisco 49ers uh, and I knew Brock Purdy was going to be out for a little bit longer, I don't know what his long-term prognosis is, I'd sign Daniel Jones right now because they got to go to Buffalo next week. And I know they're only one game out in that unbelievably mediocre NFC West. Everybody's five and six or six and five. But you lose in Buffalo, you get to five and seven. At that point, it's you win the division or or nothing. You're not going to get a wild card. And if you don't feel you can go into uh, into Buffalo with with uh, Brand- Brandon Allen, Brandon Allen, whoever whatever that quarterback's name is, uh, who they yeah. played in Green Bay with yesterday. Josh Dobbs is Josh Dobbs is out there too. Yeah, I mean, I think Daniel Jones is a better uh, is a better option than any of those guys. And granted, he doesn't know the system that well, but he's a dude who's been a six year starter in the NFL, and you, I'm sure you could get him up to speed pretty fast. 
I, I would seriously think about that if I were San Francisco. I mean, for this year, I, I that makes all the sense in the world, what you just said. For next year, for his, okay, where can I go to actually compete? That's a different discussion. Yeah. I could see a team like the Indianapolis Colts making sense because we know that Anthony Richardson, there's been issues there. He's gotten benched. There could be an opportunity. I could even see Cleveland as Cleveland, you yeah. know, with who knows what Deshaun Watson's going to do. Are they going to bring back Jameis Winston? What's that quarterback situation going to look like? And hell, maybe even Dallas, because I mean, Dallas is probably going to have a new coach, but still, what about after this year? Where do you predict there? Yeah, those are, those are interesting. Uh, you know, again, we talk about guys that have been really, really good with quarterbacks. Kevin Stefanski uh, yep. continues to win game. He, you know, Cleveland beat the Steelers Thursday night with Jameis Winston. That's the fifth different quarterback Stefanski's won a football game with in the last year and a half. So uh, he he's obviously a great at developing quarterbacks. I, you know, I you look at the teams that that are going to wind up at the top of the draft if they don't get their guy. Like let's say the Las Vegas Raiders don't get their guy at the top of the draft. They they're they're clearly not entering next year with Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Minshew or even Desmond Ritter right. as their guy. So that's a possibility. I mean, New Orleans, I don't know what New Orleans' long-term plan for Derek Carr is. I don't know who, who the head coach is going to be in New Orleans next year. They're probably going to turn that over and they may you know, get a guy. I mean, think about this. W- what if you're Ben Johnson, the offensive coordinator of the Detroit Lions? You are going to have your pick of jobs next year and and maybe a place like new orleans winds up being an attractive job for whatever reason and you want to bring in a veteran quarterback to go along with whatever young guy that you're in ultimately going to bring in as well i think daniel jones is going to be an attractive option for teams in that boat all right now let's talk about jones former team the new york <laughs> giants again they, they started tommy devito and they got crushed. Baker Mayfield and the Buccaneers go into MetLife and they win 30 to seven. The giants are now two and nine and they play the four and seven Dallas Cowboys who did go on the road and beat the commanders in a very exciting game all the way down to the end. But what is this setting up? It's setting up a Tommy DeVito and Cooper rush Thanksgiving day game. Shoot me now (laughs) before I, before I give my comments and thoughts, what is your take on this whole situation? That is not what the NFL had in mind when they scheduled this one. I think that they obviously were hoping that the Giants are a big draw from the New York metropolitan area. They're going to bring a big audience in. Thanksgiving football does well no matter what. But obviously they were hoping that Dak Prescott would be playing in that game. Very few people could pick Tommy DeVito or Cooper Rush out of a police lineup. So those are not the names, obviously, that they wanted. I'm a, yeah, you know me, Jeff. We, you and I have talked about this before. I, I'll I'll watch just about any football. I'll watch like Bethune Cookman against Samford <laughs> if that game is on. You know, like I I don't care, man. I I just love football. Uh, I, I it's the second game though. It's the middle game, right? Yes. Uh, the, yeah. So that's the sweet spot. That's a good game to have, man, because everybody's eating dinner at that point. You know, and that's, it's that it's the is background true. game. That is <laughs> so, true. So they're not going to suffer. The first game gets a lot of eyeballs because it's the first game. The night game is the feature game now. Uh, so if, if you got to have a bad game, put it in the middle. So the, the slate of games for Thanksgiving, in case you don't know, listeners out there, Chicago Bears go to the Detroit Lions in a divisional game on Thursday. That's at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. Then you have Giants-Cowboys at 4.30 Eastern time. And then you finish up with the nightcap at 8.20 on NBC. That is Dolphins at Packers. And so... I got to be honest. There's only one game there that I'm like, yeah, might be entertaining. Now that two is back, the dolphins are a little bit better, but I agree. We're typically eating during that middle game. I don't have any interest in watching this game. Tommy DeVito and the two and nine giants versus a scrub Cowboys team. They've got players on the sideline saying, man, we F and suck. Uh, that's just, yeah, not what the NFL wanted. So uh, what do you think? Well, about the what do you think about the slate though? Well, here's an angle. If you if you if you have a morbid sort of interest in the game, the loser of the uh, Dallas Giants game on Thanksgiving, especially I think if it's Dallas, might see their coach fired. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I mean Brian Dable and and Mike McCarthy are probably are two of the most common names you hear on the hot seat. So if that goes, if Dallas loses at home on Thanksgiving to Tommy DeVito. Now, granted, yes, I think they bought Mike McCarthy and that staff some time by beating Washington, but that would be a bad, bad loss 
on national television before a big audience. I mean, that could be the final straw for, for Mike McCarthy. Now, Jerry Jones has said he's not going to do anything during the season, but you never know. You never know. So no. I don't, you know, that, that's clearly the least attractive game. I think the matchup of Caleb Williams against the Lions is interesting. I think a lot of Americans, American football fans, who are still kind of new to the Detroit Lions will have an interest in that game. They were they were a good story last year, uh, but they still snuck up on some people. And this year, they've been arguably the most dominant team in the NFL. And this might be the first time they haven't had a lot of primetime games, so this might be the first time a lot of a lot of football fans will get to see them. And I think the night game is really compelling because the Dolphins are hot. Since Tua came back, but it's supposed to be cold in Green Bay. And can that's been, you know, the knock on the Dolphins. Can they go to a cold weather climate and beat a good team? And so we'll get a good look at that as well. It's going to be interesting for sure. And we'll talk about the recap next week on the show. But let's move to some big upsets that happened in week 12. They all involve divisional games. The Browns beat the Steelers in the Snow Globe game. The Cowboys upset the Commanders. The Titans beat the Texans. And the Underdog Bears took the Vikings to overtime before losing. What is it about divisional games that make them different from the other games on the schedule? But I, I've thought about this because, Coach, you and I communicate before we record. I'm going to ask you a question. Obviously, the Steelers and we're Steeler fans. They lost on Thursday Night Football. With Thursday Night Football being so unique, do you think it would be smart? And this is not hindsight 2020, Jeff's crying over spilled milk. Do you think the NFL would be smart to say, these games are so odd, we're not going to have divisional games on Thursdays at all? Uh, if you're just asking for my personal opinion, I wouldn't have any Thursday games. I, I well, think that they're it's not a, going away though. No, you're right. I mean, they're going to make the money, uh, one way or the other. Um, but the divisional games are, are tricky because obviously of how important they are to the final standings. And it feels like that's a good opportunity maybe to showcase teams that don't really play against each other very often. Yep. So you get some of the interesting interdivisional games. I mean, let, let's take like like Phil, like Pittsburgh against the Washington Commanders was a great game. Yeah, uh, that I think that ended up ended up being a national game. But in in those environments, it'd be great to showcase some of those really interesting crossovers and, and sort of leave uh, give give these coaching staffs a full week to prepare for these super important divisional games. I, I, okay, so we'll we'll go down the Thursday night path uh, another time. But what did you think about these games this weekend? I mean, all divisional games, a lot of upsets. What's your take there? It's familiarity. Just the, the familiarity that these teams have with one another, generally speaking. And granted, I know that there are some, like you can't say, oh, well, the, t the Titans and the Texans are so really familiar with one another because Brian Callahan's a first-year coach there. Yeah, but the players have played each other. The, there, there's a ton of film, a ton of film to be able to go through and uh, game plan or digest every nuance. When you're talking about really familiar opponents, teams that have that have played each other over and over again throughout the years, you've got to find wrinkles in these games to try to uh, create a, an advantage uh, or to or to do something different than what you've already put on film because you know your opponent's going to take them a, a away. And it's hard, man. A couple of years ago, we just our high school program, we have a big rival right over the bridge from from Ocean City. The, the, the school is, you know, literally about eight minutes from our school. It's our biggest rival. We're always good. They're always good. And a couple of years ago, we played them in the last week of the regular season and, and they beat us to win the division title. And that earned them a home playoff game. And just so happened the way that the, that the draw shook out, we drew them in the first round of the playoffs. So we had to play them in back-to-back -back weeks. And this is a team we play every year. And so there was so much film uh, on each other that we realized like, hey, man, we got to we gotta really reinvent ourselves in a way that we think that we can still execute, et cetera. And we made a lot of changes. And we went over there and beat them in the playoffs. Uh but it, but it, you have to think outside the box, man. You got to really, you got to, as much as anything, you have to self scout and self examine. What are we doing, and how are they going to take it away, and then make that next chess move? And that's hard, man. And it, and that's why you see so many upsets in division games. Let me ask you: of the games that were listed, which one surprised you the most? Found it the most shocking. Um, 
I think uh, you know. I think Tennessee going into Houston was a was a big shock. I mean, Cleveland winning in Pittsburgh or, or winning against Pittsburgh, not a shock. The Browns have won five out of the last six in Cleveland against the Steelers. Yeah, and then you throw in the snow, and that can kind of level the playing field. Uh, so that one didn't shock me too much. But Tennessee, Will Levis has been bad. I mean, he's been bad, and the Titans seem to be a team that kind of spiraling down the drain, so to speak. And Houston really had a chance at home to win that game and put a stranglehold on the division because they've got an, you know, I mean, Indianapolis isn't very good. And they could put the rest of the division kind of in the rear view mirror and they, they weren't able to do it. And that kind of gets you to an interesting question about Houston, who was everybody's darling last year. And then it was just, they made a lot of big uh, acquisitions in the off season. Everybody thought, man, the, the Texans are a legit contender, but I, I think their body of work this year so far suggests they're really not. Uh, yeah. So I think I keep believing in the Texans the way I keep believing in the 49ers. And it may be time to give up on both. Yeah. I mean, CJ Stroud, I mean, that there were plays where you're like, man, like what the hell happened to CJ Stroud? <laughs> Cause I've watched a lot of that game. Uh, and I was like, man, this is just very, very odd, but nonetheless, Let's move on to our fifth topic. I'm excited to talk about this one. Thanksgiving is this week, and it's a celebration of two wonderfully American subjects, food and football. What are some of your favorite Thanksgiving memories that involve those things? Coach, I'll let you go first. Yeah, I love Thanksgiving. I, I get mad that we, we we go right from Halloween to Christmas in so many uh, areas here in America. I think Thanksgiving is a great holiday, uh, both literally and figuratively. Figuratively because this is a place where we are should be grateful for so many of the things that we have and the freedoms that we enjoy. And I'm grateful for my family and, and we host Thanksgiving and we have about 30 people who come here pretty much every year. And I do all the cooking and it's a, you know, it's a big, it's a big event for us, man. And, and it's great to hang out with everybody and see everybody eat yourself into a food coma. Uh, <laughs> I always feel like if I'm not in, severe discomfort by around nine o'clock at night. I haven't really done my job on Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, but, you know, Thanksgiving football for me personally started, I mean, for my gosh, for 30 some years of my life, it would start at 10 o'clock in the morning with a game. I played Thanksgiving football was a tradition for a long time here in New Jersey. I played in Thanksgiving games. I've coached in 25 or 30 Thanksgiving games. And only in the last couple of years has that tradition kind of come to an end. So there won't be I won't be involved directly in a Thanksgiving football game this year. Uh, but it's still for me, man, it's just a, a wonderful holiday to be able to celebrate things I love the most, man. I love food. I love my, my family. I love football. And you're know, marrying them all together on Thanksgiving. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to tell a couple stories uh, about these topics. First is uh, everyone that's a Steeler fan knows the Phil Luckett game. Uh, where Pittsburgh drove that is Carnell Lake with the captains. They go to, to Detroit. It's overtime. Jerome says heads, Phil hears tails. He says he got it wrong, and the Detroit Lions end up winning the game. They go down and kick a field goal. I'll never forget coming upstairs. Our TV was down in our rec room, and my parents still live in that house. And my mom's in the kitchen slaving away. I guess she's like a she's frantic. Hey, did they win? And all the guys come up, they're like, what do you think? And it was just <laughs> – it was a giant cloud over our entire Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> that game, we were all so mad. Was that 94 or it might have been 96? I don't remember what year it was. It was the mid-90s for sure. Uh, that that game for sure, I, I know you know that game. But I, I will say also a memory that comes to mind. I was just out of college. My brother and I, who my brother lived in Northern Virginia at the time, he, was, he got me into playing adult league flag football. Now, adult league flag football, I was the quarterback because I can run and I'm fast. I'm not big, but it was basically tackle football, and then they would pull your flag after they tackled you. So we decided – <clears throat> excuse me, we decided, Hey, let's do a family Turkey bowl. And this is something I used to do as a teacher at my school. <clears throat> excuse me. So we got all these people back home. We played in a game. People got hurt. Hamstrings were pulled. It was a blast though. <laughs> it was a freaking blast coach. I mean, do you have any memories like that? Well, I, again, man, I was, I was always coaching games or playing in games on Thanksgiving day. Uh, I have a I have a Steelers memory that you were probably a little bit young for, but in I, I want to say like 1983, maybe 84, early 80s, uh, actually probably a little bit later, maybe 85 or so. 
They go they go into Detroit on Thanksgiving Day and just get absolutely shellacked by the Lions, 45 to 3. Barry Sanders runs all over them. And I just remember my cousin relentlessly, relentlessly like needling me about it right after all day long at, at Thanksgiving dinner. Right. He just kept going, kept going, kept going. And I just remember telling him like, all right, man, like I, I've kind of had it. I've kind of had enough. <laughs> and, uh, and he just kept it up, kept it up. And I remember like picking him up and just body slamming him in the living room. <laughs> and then all the ants screaming and my mom yelling at me and his mom yelling at him. And like, it became a big thing. Uh, so, you know, we hugged it out afterwards, but uh, you know, like you can literally get yourself, emotionally inv involved and when you're around your family and you know it's a big uh it's a it's an event for sure yeah and now this year i've turned from like football player to now i just cook and so i'm doing both of our turkeys this year we're hosting here at our house i'm smoking one of our turkeys on wednesday and then i'm grilling the other one on thursday wow and so it's phenomenal food. Like the, the turkey tastes so good. It's it's fantastic. I'll probably put some videos out there on social media for people to see. But nice. uh, that's what I do now. That's my job is I'm in charge of the turkey. So I'm looking forward to that for sure. Hey, you want to really spice up your Thanksgiving dinner, Jeff? Right, right as everybody's ready, right as everybody's ready to sit down to eat, just go, hey, what would you guys think about the election? Oh, <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I've already told my kids because my kids are 16, my oldest daughter's 13 and under. And so they knew the election was happening. We don't talk uh -huh. politics much in our house. And my oldest daughter would go to relatives and say, who'd you vote for? And they're like, that's kind of personal. And I'm like, please don't do this at Thanksgiving. <laughs> please oh do God. not say this. <laughs> there are strong <laughs> political divides between my family, my oh, wife's yeah. family in general. So yes, there's a absolutely no talking politics rule. Absolutely. Yeah. You got to avoid that. Like the plague. All right, let's finish this up with the player profile. You want to talk about Brandon Graham, the linebacker for the Eagles who unfortunately uh, made it public to the media that he tore his triceps tendon. He's out for the rest of the year. And some are saying this could be the end of his career. What's your take? Yeah. You know, that's why I brought him up because if this is the end for Brandon Graham, it, what a, what a career he's had. He, he is an outlier. Brandon Graham has spent 15 years with the Philadelphia Eagles. You don't really ever see that happen anymore. I remember Brandon Graham really well because way back in 2009, when you and I, you might, you might not have even been around yet, Jeff, but when I was involved in the old Behind the Steel Curtain, which is where we mm -hmm. all kind of met, they right. did a Behind the Steel Curtain community draft, and I had just started to kind of do a little bit of writing on that old website. And, and I said, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, take part. And uh, my team was the Kansas City Chiefs. And I drafted Brandon Graham for the Kansas City Chiefs uh, in that draft. And ultimately, the Eagles took him. And he's been in Philadelphia ever since. And again, man, I, quarterbacks, you know, franchise quarterbacks will stick around for a long time like that. But defensive players, linebackers, that is really just unheard of in the NFL these days. So 15 years in Philly, Brandon Graham will always be beloved by Eagles fans. For sacking Tom Brady uh, and forcing the fumble that ultimately ended uh, that Super Bowl, where where the Eagles come away with their their first Super Bowl title back in 2017, and was having a heck of a game on Sunday night, had two sacks and was a menace. I mean, the Rams couldn't block him, but unfortunately, late in that game in the fourth quarter, tears his tricep. And again, man, you know that, that, those are tough injuries to recover from. Those muscles uh, are are don't heal real easily and can be very delicate in the, in the rehab. So if this is it for Brandon Graham, man, heck of a career for that, for that man. Congratulations to him. As Mike Tomlin said, when Cam Hayward signed his three-year extension, that Cam Hayward is going to be a one helmet guy. Uh -huh. Those guys yeah. that play for that long in the NFL are rare. Uh, you see a lot of players that play for 15 years, but how many of them have only done one uniform their entire career. And so I always say that for that to happen, some, and that individual has to be special. He's got to be good enough, first and foremost. He also has to be willing to say, you know what, I'm just going to take what I can get, and I want to stay here. And yep. that's that's definitely true for Brandon Graham. So good for bringing him up. Let's hope that maybe he wants to come back. Uh, it's tough. That's the same injury that Aaron Smith had. You remember Aaron Smith on the defensive line for the Steelers, and it ultimately ended up ending his career. So we'll see. But in the meantime, Coach, uh, what's coming up on the call sheet this week? Yeah, man, so I've been crunching some numbers the last couple of days. You know, there's a real uh, almost like a phenomenon, I would call it, in the NFL uh, in terms of going for it on fourth downs now. When you look at 
how aggressive teams are going for it on fourth downs. It is a huge departure from what the norm has been in football forever. So, so one of the things we're going, to, we're going to really focus on on the call sheet this week is why are teams going for it on fourth down so much and, and what kind of success are they having? So we're kind of taking a deep dive into these teams that are obsessed with the metrics and their fourth down aggressiveness. That's going to be interesting. But, Coach, I'll tell you what, have a happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the time with family and football and all that fun stuff. And uh, we will talk next week, man. Take it easy.